thank you for coming. If you do not have an outline of the sermon, please raise your hand and you will be given an outline. I want everyone to have an outline of the sermon. By the way, the leadership, part of the leadership of this church is a nine-member board. We have a nine-member board. Uh, they are appointed <clears throat> on a, our business meeting night, and so we encourage you to be here. And uh, the church ratifies uh, that part of leadership. So we encourage you to be here if you are a member or if you are active in this church with your giving. <clears throat> we want you to come that night. Now, if you're not a member, you can't vote. But we want you to know what's going on in the church. And we give out our, we give out our financial report on the business night. So please make plans to come and be part of that. How many of you know you, we need to know what's going on? We need to be accountable. I need to be accountable. The body needs to be accountable, each of us. So we encourage you to do that. Thank you for coming. Without you, we would not have church. You're important. This morning has been already a, just a great morning. I have just one word to say for the songs, the three songs that were sung. Powerful. They were just powerful. And uh, I just really appreciate the team and appreciate people working hard to provide music and singing for this congregation. But I, I appreciate you singing with them because it's important that we join with them, certainly, in song. The title of the sermon this morning is The Song of Battle. <clears throat> we started this series back in the first of, of, the, of the year, the series is God Gave Us Song and how important songs and music and singing is in the Bible. And today we will share with you the song of battle. <clears throat> and uh, our next sermon will be the song of breakthrough. And then thirdly, we'll preach a sermon on, and you will not want to miss this sermon the song of birthing, taken from Isaiah 54. The song of breakthrough is taken from Acts chapter 16, and this is taken, the song of battle is taken from uh, 2 Chron Chronicles chapter 20. Uh, I, 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 I hope that we all understand the importance of the Old Testament. Someone might say, I don't understand the Old Testament. I don't know how to, to interpret the Old Testament. Well, we encourage you to get some uh, helps, whether it's commentaries. Uh, we have some, there, there are some great commentaries. Get several translations of the scripture. It is important that we know uh, somewhat what went on in the Old Testament. One of the things that uh, we know is that Israel was God's chosen people, God's chosen people. And they came from, of course, from Abraham. And it's just a great story, but it's more than just a story or just what happened. It ties in with the New Testament. Israel was uh, birth, of course, and became a nation. And then there was the division between Israel and Judah. And today we're going to be talking about the fourth king of Judah. The fourth king of Judah. And uh, I want to read some scripture, if you will, read with me, taken from the 20th chapter of Second Chronicles, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> it happened after this that the people of Moab and the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehosh Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are Hazazon Tamar. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judea. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah that 
came to seek the Lord. Very important. I, I have recorded also Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 14 through 23. I, I, I won't take time to read these, script, these verses, but I would encourage you this week sometime to open the Old Testament to Second Chronicles chapter 20 and read that entire chapter. Second Chronicles chapter 10, 20. It is a great story of how Jehoshaphat fought against three nations that allied themselves together, together to destroy Israel or the, to destroy Judah. And this very good king, he was a righteous king. He was a good king. Jehoshaphat had riches. He had abund in abundance. And he had honor in abundance. Uh, he brought the people back to the Lord in revival. As you know, in the Old Testament, Israel would come to the Lord and serve the Lord. And then they would... Uh, began to serve false gods and backslide and God would allow the enemy to come in and under that kind of pressure, under that kind of judgment, they would return back to the Lord. But Jehoshaphat, this great good king, brought Judah back to God. It, uh, there was just a great spiritual reform. Great man. You ought to just look up Jehoshaphat. And look how he depended on God. Jehoshaphat had a skilled army of 1,600,000. That's going to be important as we go through this because I want you to notice something. Look at your introduction, if you will. Now, the name, of, the name Jehoshaphat means Yahweh uh, has judges. Or has judged, I'm sorry. Yahweh has judged. Jehoshaphat, Yahweh has judged. Against all odds, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, was victorious against a formidable en enemy. The king winning the battle with God's help is not unusual for the nation of Israel or the nation of Judah. So they won the battle. And that's not unusual because if they would come to God during the time of judgment and cry out to God, God would give them, give them victory and they certainly would be victorious. But the method by which the battle was won is quite unusual. And listen at me, and presents lessons that we may glean from today. I don't want to look at something in the, it, that happened thousands of years ago. I don't want to look at something in the Old Testament or either in the New Testament and not understand that this is important for me today. It is very important that we glean these truths from this great happening in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Notice, first of all, was Jehoshaphat's foes. It was an invasion of several nations that came out against him. Second of all, C.J. Cranes uh, 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 writes, sometimes the enemies in life seem unbeatable. You ever have those enemies? No matter what enemy it is, enemies will come your way. Whatever trial, whatever temptation, there are many enemies, whether it's uh, an addiction, whether it's a bondage of, of some kind, whether it's pride, whether it's uh, uh, unforgiveness, there are always, there's always something that the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, is going to attack the believer with. Can you say amen? Look at your neighbor and say, stay awake. Come on. We have enemies formable enemies. And Jehoshaphat, first of all, he was afraid. He knew Israel lacked the power to defend itself. 
But understand something as we look at Jehoshaphat's enemies and understand as we look at our enemies that man's extremity is God's opportunity. And it was important that even though he was afraid, and we'll deal with that fear in a moment, even though he was afraid, he turned to God. Instead of pacing the floor, wringing his hands, he sought the Lord and asked the nation to fast, asked the nation of Judah to pray with him for divine guidance. Now let's know this the sequence here. It was an enemy. These enemies, it was a huge force. Je Jehoshaphat was shaken, and he begins to pray. The country united, each and every one united in prayer and in fasting. In fact, the Bible lists the wives. It says even the little children, the sons. So all the families and all the people came when Jehoshaphat put out the word we're going to fast and we are going to pray he had a specific place to pray he prayed at the temple I mean wouldn't you pray wouldn't you call on God to have all this big host to come out against you now some people says that Jehoshaphat's uh, army was outnumbered I'm not too sure of that I did not read one commentary one commentator that did not believe that Jehoshaphat was outnumbered I'm not sure as I said earlier his army consisted of 1 million and 600,000 skilled militia I don't think it was that I think it was this that Jehoshaphat knew unless God helped him, it didn't matter how many he had fighting for him. It didn't matter what he did. And America is drunken on her ability to be successful. There was a time that we trusted God. There was a time the church trusted God. But we've grown fat in our abilities in our ways to succeed and we know how to handle it no matter what comes our way we're able to succeed and handle that Jehoshaphat says I can't do it in myself the carnal way of handling the enemy in your life is not going to work you must defeat the enemy through and by the word of God the power of God and certainly the spirit of God so what he did, he began to pray, powerful prayer. He honored God. He recognized the sovereignty of God. And here is one of the things that he said in his prayer. He said, Lord, the Ammonites and the Moabites, when we came, listen to this, the children of Israel came out of bondage. They marched toward Canaan land, and God gave them victory after victory, and all the other uh, nationalities, the other people were defeated in the battles. And here they come upon Moab and the Ammonites, and God says, don't attack them. Leave them alone. You go around, detour around Moab. And so they did. They left them alone. And here Jehoshaphat is reminding God, God, when we came and you gave us victory after victory, we didn't attack Moab and Ammon. And now here, this is the way they are repaying us. And so he's praying to God. He says we are helpless before this Vanda horde. The message uses that. They were ruthless people, evil people coming out against the nation of Judah. And so he gathers the people together to pray. And they begin to pray as they fasted. And as they were praying, there was a man by the name of Jehaziel. 
Jehaziel the prophet. Listen at me. We need to hear from the men and women of God. And they need to be able to have their ear to the pulse of what God wants. Amen? They need to be hearing from God. We need to be hearing from God so the people can hear from God. He stood up and he said to the nation of Israel, he said to Jehoshaphat, be not afraid. He said, this battle you will not fight. Now, some people say, we don't have to fight in a battle. There's some battles we have to fight in. He said, I thought the battle was the Lord's. It is sometimes, and sometimes it's you. He said, I don't believe we have to fight. Why did, you, why did he give you a sword and a shield? Why did he give you equipment if you don't have to fight? We have to fight. But he said, this battle, you don't need to fight. He, look at number three. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast route, Judah. He acknowledged God's sovereignty. Listen to what he said. I love this, what Jehoshaphat said in his prayer. We do not know what to do, but our eyes upon, are upon you. God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you. I don't know how to handle my family. I don't know how to handle the problems that I face each day. I don't know what to do when it seems like the devil throws everything at me he possibly can, including the kitchen sink. I, when, I'm, when I'm struggling, I'm struggling physically. I'm struggling mentally. I'm struggling emotionally. And God, I don't know what to do. But my eyes are upon you. He committed the situation to God. He acknowledged this one thing. Let me ask you something. Will you do this? He acknowledged this one thing, that God was the only one that could help him. America's in a mess. I mean, we're prospering. We're blessed. But spiritually, America is decayed, immoral. America. And the only thing that will help America, and I hope that we would acknowledge that, is God Almighty. It's not Washington. You think the Republicans and the Democrats are going to solve our problem? Absolutely not. You think our growing economy is going to solve our problem? No. You think our beautiful churches and our religion is going to solve our problem? Absolutely not. Our skill, our abilities, our strength, our military, is that going to solve our problems? No. We need to acknowledge that, God, you're the only one that can save us. You're the only one. He praised God's glory and took comfort in the very promises of God. Then God spoke through the prophet, and he says, you're going to have victory. But I want you to take that army you have, and I want you to put the choir out front. <laughs> I mean, you, you just don't do that. The powerful army goes before everyone else. But the prophet of the Lord told Jehoshaphat to arrange it to where the singers and the praising congregation would go out front. Matt, you, you gather everybody together. You get on the front line. What would you say? With all these thousands and tens of thousands of soldiers marching towards us, and you want us to be on the front line? Are you sure you've heard from God? Oh, listen at me. The victory came in a strange but powerful manner. The worshipers were on the front line. Listen at me. God wants us to be able to sing in the midst of our trouble. The way we experience triumph. It's when we praise God and honor God. The Bible says he is enthroned in the praises of his people. You know what that word enthroned means? It means he sits down with you. 
where you're sitting today, God's sitting next to you. Because those three songs, I mean, you're talking about God sitting down. I believe he was sitting there just enjoying every bit of it. Hallelujah. He says he is enthroned in the praises of his people. Something wonderful happens when the church begins to honor God and begins to praise God. There's something about it that moves God. And these singers in front of the army was moving God. It moved God. Some were appointed to sing to the Lord and praise the Him in the beauty of holiness. Hallelujah. How long has it been since we opened our mouth? Whether at church or whether riding down the highway or whether in a secret closet, how long has it been since we began to open our mouth and begin to honor the Lord with praise and thanksgiving and begin to lift up our voices to him? Brother, Brother Don, I can't even sing. You can sing in some measure. If not, just say the words. Begin to honor him. The enemy was defeated because they had a fight song that honored God and worshiped God. Let me ask you something this morning. What is your fight song? What song? Any particular song? Do you have a song that you like to sing? Do you have some way that you'd like to praise God? I mean, when they're rolling you down the corridor of the hospital and they said you have a, a, a terminal illness and you don't know what's on the other side of the doors... It's cold in there. They stand in there with masks on. They stand in there with their heads covered. And there's about 10 people standing in there. And you don't know what's on the other side of the operation. You know what's going to go on. Can you have a song? Can you praise God? Yes. I'm here to tell you, you can praise God. You can say glory to God in the highest. And we bless your name, Lord. You say, Brother Don, how can you do that? Because you know the victory is through and by God Almighty. Give a glory a good clap offering. Hallelujah. The victory is through the Lord God Almighty. Worship is powerful. Joshua told the children of Israel, march around the walls of Jericho. And you be quiet. Well, that's hard for Pentecostals to be quiet. Don't say anything. Don't talk. And you march around that wall seven times in seven days. And then the last day, the seventh time, when the trumpets are blown, you shout to the Lord. Wait a minute, jo Joshua, the walls are still standing. I'm telling you to shout. Wait a minute, the, the enemy is not defeated. Wait a minute, there's an army over there. We're not an army. We've been enslaved for 400 years. Joshua, wait, he said, shout. They shouted, and the walls of Jericho fell. It'll happen. Are the walls built around? Are you in bondage? Has a Satan, does Satan have you bound? Begin to praise God. You say, Brother Don, does it work? It works. I've experienced it. A man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. I have, you have experienced it. No doubt many have experienced the power of this blessed, blessed Praise unto the Lord. Gideon, God led him to lead the children of Israel. The enemy had come out against Israel. And God called Gideon. You call him me? Who, me? He was thrashing wheat. He was a farmer. You say, you call him me? He said, yeah. He gathered all the army, tens of thousands, and all the army together. And God said, wait a minute, Gideon, you got too many. He said, what? I need more. He said, reduce the army. He kept reducing the army down, kept reducing the army down, and God told him to reduce it down. And finally, amongst all these thousands of enemies that were out there, God gave him 300 people. Somebody say, wow, 
Wow, isn't that something? You got to fight through all these people with 300 people. He said, take a picture, put a light in it, take the trumpets, and we're going to go out and fight them. You're going to, well, we're going to bang them over the head with this trumpet? We're going to break the picture over their head? No, 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 no. You just do what I tell you to do. See, we've got to follow the Lord and be obedient to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And those 300 men, one few gathered here, few gathered here, few gathered here, and they started running. They broke the picture. The lights came on, and they started the trumpet sounding, and that whole army was defeated because of praise unto God. I'm enthroned. I remain. Praise brings God's presence. Praise. Brings God's presence. What do we learn from this? Brother Don, can we learn anything from that Old Testament story? Yes. First of all, we learn that Solomon, look at your notes. This is this number one under number five is going to be one of the most important things I'll say all day long. Solemn acts of committal are of great importance in our spiritual life. There's probably most of us in this church have needs, specific needs. Jehoshaphat had a need. He had a specific need. And he gathered all of them together at the temple, standing in front of the temple. He took it and he, this one solemn act of committal. He said, I can't do it. Our eyes are on you. If you have a need today, I'm going to challenge you to make that need known. The Bible says confess your faults one to another. We can't even confess our faults to God. Come on. If every one of us that had a need, if we're battling whatever the battle might be, whatever the trial might be, some of us are sitting here in bondage today. How do you know, Brother Don? Well, I just know if we're not careful, the enemy will bind us. We'll be bound by hate and bitterness, unforgiveness, fear, angry, anger, jealousy, all kind of bondage. But we don't want it to be known. And we used to ask many years ago, are you lost? Raise your hand. If you have a need, raise your hand. And people would do that. People won't do that anymore. We, we stopped it a long time ago. Then you ask people, everyone to come to the altar. And we all come. And I appreciate that. And I think it's very important. It is important that we all come. And then I say, if you have a need, raise your hand. And we might have three or four to raise their hand. Now, I've been mean. I know I'm mean. But I want to see people set free. I want to see people commit those needs to God. You say, well, I'm not too sure about that commitment. Well, let's listen. It's in 1 Peter 2.23. Who, when he, speaking of Jesus Christ, re was reviled, did not revile in return when he suffered. He did not threaten, but committed himself to him, God the Father, who judges righteously. Here is God Almighty. Jesus Christ is making a commitment. I think if he makes a commitment, I ought to make a commitment. Listen to this one found in 2 Timothy. Paul writing, first chapter, verse 12. For this reason, Paul says, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have been, I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed. What I've committed. What are you committing today? I'm committing my cares, my concerns, I'm committing my family. I'm committing my life. It's time that the church rises up and starts committing to God. 
Years ago, some of our greatest services were Sunday nights when we had crowds larger than Sunday morning. Sunday nights when people, the Holy Spirit would begin to move and that whole congregation, that whole congregation, one would go to the other one. Another one would go to the other one. You know, I've said some things about you this week and I'm sorry. You know, I need this and I, I confess this, I confess. And that whole congregation, I was a young man at that time, but it was a wonderful scene to see people confessing and committing and having forgiveness and tears were flowing down people's faces and they were totally and completely set free. You'll not be free when you walk out those doors if there's not some act of commitment to God today. Hard words, but it's absolutely the truth. You want to be free? Get all that stuff out of you. All that unforgiveness. All that gossip that you've had going on. All that jealousy. All that pride. I asked myself as I looked at this, I said, Brother Don, what keeps people from really committing? I think one reason is pride. I think another reason is fear. Well, let me tell you what another reason is. I believe it's just plain old stubbornness. Now, don't you get mad at me. I've already, I've already got my ties. You can't take them back. I, I, I just feel it's so strong. And I feel the church walks around bound. Not free. Oh, God knows we're free to go to heaven. We're free to bless people. But, I mean, totally free. You want to be free? Commit. Look at what it says. Solemn acts of committal are of great importance in our spiritual life, whether it's bad habits, whether it's a temper, whether it's a temptation to overcome. Let each be committed to things. Somebody say amen. 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 Let's commit those things. I struggle. You say, preacher, you struggle. I struggle a lot. You know where my place of committal is? Right here. I've hurt my wife and I'll come and say, God, forgive me. I'll confess it. But I don't stop there. I go to my wife and I say, honey, I'm sorry. Now, that's the hardest thing to do. We don't like to ask somebody to forgive us. Come on. We know we're wrong. We know we said things we should not say, but we just, we bottle it all up and keep it right here. We keep it close to the bosom right here. Boy, I'll tell you, this is... I wish I hadn't come today. I wish I'd sit at home, got, stayed home and got ready for the big game tonight. No, I'm glad you're here, and I hope you're glad you're here because I want to see God do some things in our lives. I want us to be able to sing, I'm free, so free. I in the Spirit and the Spirit in me. I'm rejoicing because I am not what I was. Thanks to Calvary's tree. And that's where your and my battle is won. Is that the cross? If you don't think the devil hates the cross, you begin to plead the blood of Jesus Christ. You once again kneel at the cross and begin to sing songs of the cross and begin to know what Jesus Christ did at the cross. Amen? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, the power of darkness was conquered at the cross. Sing a song about the cross. Sing a song about the Believe that God is touching your life. Spiritual warfare must start and end with the cross. Jesus Christ died on the cross to give you and I great victory. What else did we learn in this study? Jehoshaphat did not underestimate the enemy. 
Sometimes we underestimate the enemy. Sometimes we don't realize we're up against a foe. Demonic forces. That's not to cause us to be afraid. No rash contempt of the impending peril. Listen to me. Let me say that again. No rash, rash contempt for the impending peril. Listen. When you get in trouble, you need to say, this is serious. And get on your knees and go to your knees and go. It's a call the church and call people to pray with me. Pray for me. This is serious. The soul, the spirit of man, he did not overestimate the problem. Some people underestimate the problem. Some people overestimate the problem, the enemy. He his was not a panic fright. It says he feared, but he didn't panic. He didn't throw up, throw up the white flag of surrender. There was no desperation. Jehoshaphat was not in despair, but he went to God in prayer. And he believed God. It's quiet. It's okay. I hope you're thinking hard, and I hope we'll say, Lord, I'm going to commit this thing that I've been carrying around all these years to you. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take it out. I've had this against this sister for a long time. I've had this against this brother for a long time. The family's been in a dis disruptive place for a long time. Be honest with yourself. Honesty is so important. The enemy, listen to this, and I'm closing as they come to sing. The enemy was confused. The Moabites, the Ammonites, Mount Seir, all three groups started attacking each other. Boom! Boom! The Ammonites and the Moabites, listen to me. The Ammonites and the Moabites killed all Mount Seir's soldiers. Then the Ammonites and the Moabites, they turned on each other and killed each other. That battle was not their battle. It was God's battle. And God fought their battle. Let me tell you now, God will turn your enemy into confusion. Let me say it again. God will turn your enemy into confusion. You trust God. You commit it to God. Take it and just give it to him. Don't hold on to it. Don't hold on to it. Give it to him. Lord, I commit my problem. I commit my sickness to you today. I commit my jealousy to you today. May your Holy Spirit give me strength over it. May I not exercise jealousy any longer. I commit this habit that I have over to you. The battle's not yours if you're committed to Christ. I commit my son and my daughter to you. That's hard. Sometimes my wife and I think my son, Neil, is going to be raptured. He walks around the house praising God. He listens to songs praising God. He gets in the shower and he's praising God. He's lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's almost a continuous praise. He hates sin. He hates the lifestyle that he lived. He was on drugs. He was hooked on alcohol. He was away from God. There were times I would even have to go get him out of jail. I don't think he'd mind me telling it. I told it before. We prayed for Neil. We'd walk from, on Talcott, we'd walk from one window to another window looking for him to come home. There's nothing that hurts your, children, your heart like the children do. 
take that son, that daughter, that grandson, that granddaughter, that husband, that wife. That struggle in your breast, recognize it. Don't underestimate it. Don't underestimate that problem you're dealing with. Oh, don't overestimate it either, but please don't underestimate it. Take it and say, God, I give it to you because I want to be free. I know what it is to walk in bondage. I know what it is to do things that I'm ashamed of and feel things that I'm ashamed of. You say, Brother Nunn, I'm not sure I want to confess. I confess before everyone. When I was carrying a problem, a major problem, I didn't overestimate it, but I sure didn't underestimate it. I took it and I stood up before the congregation and I named what it was. You think that's not embarrassing? Committed it to God. That's all I'm asking you to do today. By faith. By faith. So, Father, I'm going to take this area where I'm struggling with. I'm going to take this sex problem I've got and I'm, I'm going to commit it to you and I want you to cleanse me, Lord. Cleanse my mind, my heart. I want to be pure. I can't stress this enough. I know the Holy Spirit is speaking this congregation this morning. I know He is. If you're sitting there and you have an area in your life you really need, Jesus came into the city. And there was a man sitting by the wayside. Jesus walked on by him and he began to scream out, holler out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus turned and he told some of them, bring him to me. And they went and got blind Bartimaeus and brought him to Jesus. Jesus didn't just lay his hands on him and pray for him to be healed. He just didn't speak blind, uh, healing to his blinded eyes. Jesus said, what do you want me to do? Confess it. Name it. Recognize it. Own up to it. Jesus knew he was blind. Everyone there knew he was blind. But Jesus wanted him to commit that blindness to him. And God touched him. God touched him. Father, we love you today. Lord, I... I just thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your word. Lord, help us to be like Jehoshaphat. Help us to take whatever enemy we have, the enemy of our soul, the enemy of our walk in the kingdom, whatever enemy is fighting us today, help us not to underestimate it, no, we're not going to overestimate it and think, we, God, you can't move. But help us to understand, God, that we've got to commit it to you. We've got to be honest. Lord, remove our stubbornness. Father, remove our pride. God, take away our fear. And help us to be an open book to you that your Holy Spirit might do a work in us. In Jesus' name we pray.